Welcome to the Excellence in Church Administration podcast, informing, encouraging, and supporting your church. Your hosts are Michael Martin and Dan Busby from ECFA. I hope everyone is doing well. We're so glad you joined us for another Excellence in Church Administration podcast. This is Dan Busby, president of ECFA, and with me in studio today is your podcast co-host and vice president of church relations at ECFA, Michael Martin. (laughs) Well, hey, thanks, Dan. It's uh, great to be back, as always, for another podcast. Do you think we're starting to get the hang of this thing by now? I think so. We've enjoyed tackling some great topics on the last few podcasts, and today we finish our two-part tax series with a discussion around church reporting made easy. That's right. And if you missed uh, the last podcast on ministers' taxes made easy, don't forget to check it out. So, Michael, we know it's a reality that most people don't choose to serve in the church or ministry because they're really excited about keeping up with things like employer tax reporting issues. But as the title of this podcast suggests on excellence in church administration, we believe everything we do is for the glory of God and should be done with excellence, even our tax reporting obligations as a church. Well, that's right. And I I know we joke about that, but I really do want to just give a shout out to all those that are tuning into the podcast because really by listening, I think it's obvious that you care about administering the church's finance with excellence and integrity, and you want to do things right. So really hats off to you. And, uh, you know, don't forget also to tell your colleagues and friends who may be interested to tune in as well. So, like the podcast on Ministers' Taxes Made Easy, the great news is we've developed an ebook here at ECFA that can be incredibly helpful to you in this area. You'll hear more details later in the podcast on how you can get your free copy of this resource. Also, like the last podcast, we're going to tackle this topic head on by talking about 10 of the biggest tax mistakes made by churches. Are you ready, Michael? Hey, absolutely. And uh, also, just like the last podcast, we're going to interject a little bit of tax humor just to kind of lighten it up a little bit. And uh, to get us started, here's one. People who complain about taxes can be divided into, get ready, two classes, men and women. That, that's a good one, Michael. <laughs> um, well, let's move on to the first tax mistake we want to cover. The church does not report ministerial compensation. Well, it doesn't get much more basic than that. Every church is responsible to report a minister's taxable compensation to the IRS. A Form W-2 should be used for this purpose. While there are some unique tax rules that apply to churches and pastors, there is no wholesale exemption from reporting a pastor's compensation as an employee of the church. All right. Well, great start. Our number two mistake is the church pays or reimburses for out-of-pocket medical expenses without establishing a proper plan. So here we have, again, some overlap from the last podcast on minister's tax issues. And there we mentioned that this issue has really become a lot more complex on the heels of the Affordable Care Act. The big mistake to avoid is treating medical expense reimbursements as tax-free unless the church has a properly established plan that meets certain tax law guidelines. And you probably have heard the names of some of those formal plans like health reimbursement arrangements, uh, health savings accounts, or flexible spending accounts. Those are just some examples of the type of plan that a church should have before making Making those reimbursements. Yes, and for number three, we have the church makes payments to a minister's investment accounts and the payments are treated as tax-free. Well, in reality, if a church remits contributions under a qualified retirement plan for a minister like a 403b or 401k plan, these amounts are generally tax-deferred for ministers. However, Payments by a church to the minister's personal investment accounts are fully taxable and should be reported on the minister's form W-2. This is a great example of some of the traps out there for the unwary. 
even though the church is well-intentioned and wanting to provide retirement assistance for the pastor, if done so in the wrong way, the church ends up violating the law. Well, that's a good point. Um, so for mistake number four, we have the church reimburses a minister's personal commuting miles. Uh, a church may reimburse ministers for church-related mileage at the established IRS rate, which is adjusted every year for inflation. But a church should not reimburse commuting miles, which are considered personal expenses of the pastor. And I know sometimes in this area, it can be confusing to sort through what miles are considered personal versus those that are you know, maybe ministry-related. Um, and to help us cut through some of that confusion, we've got a very helpful diagram and explanation in our annual tax and finance guide that is published each year with Zondervan. That's right. And we're already halfway at mistake five, which is FICA tax is deducted from ministerial salary and matched by the church. You know, this one is important enough and so often overlooked that we probably should have made it the number one mistake. Even ministers who are considered employees for income tax purposes, which is almost always the case, are considered self-employed for Social Security tax purposes. I'll say that again. Ministers who are employees for income tax purposes are treated uniquely under the tax law as self-employed for Social Security tax purposes. With that being the case, note that all qualified ministers are subject to self-employment Social Security tax using Form SE. A church should never, and I would rarely use the word never, but a church should never withhold FICA-type Social Security tax from ministerial pay and match the amount withheld. FICA-type Social Security only applies to other lay or non-ministerial employees at the church. You know, Michael, this may be the most common tax mistake we see churches make because those who are serving as church treasurers or administrators often assume that the same FICA type Social Security applies to pastors like other employees when it does not. No, that's absolutely right. Very common mistake that we see. And uh, I think that explanation really brings some much needed clarity to that area. So we hope that's helpful. For the biggest mistake of number six, we have the church reimburses a minister's expenses without adequate documentation. And again, uh, we did touch on this in the last podcast from the minister's tax perspective, but we strongly encourage every church to adopt and follow an accountable expense reimbursement plan. Rather than asking pastors to claim unreimbursed ministry-related expenses on their personal income taxes, an accountable plan where the church reimbursements are tax-free really just results in the best stewardship outcome because of those hurdles that the minister would have to overcome in claiming those unreimbursed expenses personally as a miscellaneous itemized deduction. But as noted in this mistake, be sure that only those expenses that are supported by adequate documentation are reimbursed under that accountable reimbursement plan that we've been talking about. Otherwise, all reimbursements that are made under the plan could be put in jeopardy. Well, that's right, Michael. And you know, adequate documentation versus inadequate documentation is the difference from night to day, but there's still a lot of confusion on that topic. And, and that reminds me of what Will Rogers once said. He said, income tax has made more liars out of the American people than golf. <laughs> well, let's move on to mistake seven. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> the church does not formally designate a housing allowance, but treats a minister as having a proper housing allowance. You know, the housing allowance can be one of the most significant tax benefits available to ministers. However, under the tax law, it is crucial that some basic requirements be met before the benefits are extended. One of those elements that must be satisfied is for the church as the employer to formally designate a portion of the minister's cash compensation as a housing allowance. And unless a church has formally and prospectively designated a housing allowance for ministers, a housing allowance should not be excluded from the minister's form W-2. 
That's right, and we are now entering the home stretch, and that is mistake number eight. The church distributes benevolence amounts based solely on a giver's designation. And, uh, you know, for all those listening, probably you're familiar with, and most churches uh, in America, having a benevolence type fund to help those who are in need, maybe inside or outside the church. And so sometimes we get the question here at ECFA, do gifts for the benevolence fund qualify as tax deductible to the giver? And, you know, a lawyer's favorite answer is always, it depends, right? Contributions to a general benevolence fund without a giver's designation of the benevolent recipient, those will generally constitute tax deductible con- uh, contributions. However, gifts that are restricted for a particular benevolent recipient are typically not tax deductible because the contributions are being earmarked for a particular private benefit. So just to reiterate, the mistake here would be uh, allowing folks who designate benevolence gifts for a particular recipient uh, to, to claim those gifts or to receive those gifts as tax deductible from the church. All right. Well, Michael, I think I'll take mistakes nine and 10 together. They both relate to acknowledging charitable gifts for tax purposes and were covered in more detail in our earlier podcast episode on the seven deadly sins of charitable gift acknowledgments. But just as a refresher, these mistakes include the church acknowledges property gifts and values them for the giver. As we previously discussed, the church should simply provide a description for the property gift rather than attempt to appraise and provide a dollar amount for the giver's tax deduction purposes. And also, the other mistake, the church receives a gift of services and receipts the gift with a stated dollar amount. As a review, we've learned that certain gifts like services and the rent-free use of property do not qualify as tax deductible contributions for gifts to the church. Letters of appreciation, communicating um, the appreciation of the church can be issued for gifts of services or the rent for use of property, but they do not qualify for a charitable gift acknowledgement. Well, that's absolutely right. And, uh, you know, that kind of wraps up all of our 10 biggest tax mistakes that are made by churches. And I hope this review has been really helpful uh, for everyone who's listening. And so it's now time for us to take a couple of church reporting questions here in the answers to your questions segment. The first question that we have today uh, relates back to housing allowance. And the question is, if housing allowance is not included as part of the pastor's taxable compensation, so that's correct, um, the question is, is it reported anywhere by our church on the pastor's Form W-2? So a great question, and I think we could just take it here in a couple of steps. Um, The first being, the housing allowance designated by the church should be subtracted from total reportable compensation before the church completes the data on Form W-2. After doing so, uh, the designated housing allowance may be reflected on the pastor's Form W-2 in box number 14 with the notation housing allowance. Um, This isn't required anywhere, but it is suggested we've seen by the IRS in their publication for minister's tax issues. Uh, And if you're looking for that publication, it's out online, publication 517. So that's kind of their recommended uh, practice. But also, maybe rather than reporting in box 14 on Form W-2, the church could also choose to report the designated housing allowance to the pastor by providing a different or a separate statement from Form W-2, something like a memo or a letter. Um, And if that's the case, the statement shouldn't be attached to the minister's income tax return. So if it's in a separate statement, um, don't have the pastor submit that along with the income tax returns. Um, The last maybe part of this question, I guess, would be if the church does happen to make the mistake of including the housing allowance on Form W-2 in box one, the church should go ahead and prepare a corrected Form W-2 to make up for that mistake. 
All right, excellent. And now for our second question. This one is on church benevolence reporting and benevolence policies. Our church provides financial support to the needy in our community through a benevolence fund. I have questions about meeting the IRS standards for dispersing the funds and proper documentation and reporting. Does ECFA have any resources available to guide churches on the proper maintenance and record keeping for benevolence ministries? Well, let's take um, the reporting part of that question first. So the question is, if the church has made a benevolence payment to someone in need, is it somehow reportable by the church for tax purposes like a Form W-2 or 1099? It is our understanding that benevolence payments are generally not reportable. However, if your church happens to provide benevolence assistance to an employee, there is the presumption that it would be reportable on Form W-2 as compensation. As far as guidelines for documenting a benevolence policy, this is a good time to mention that the church reporting ebook prepared by ECFA contains a sample policy that may be helpful for your church. It also covers many more of the reporting issues we've talked about today and so much more to help make the topic of church reporting a little easier and less overwhelming. Tracy Weber is going to tell us more about the Church Reporting Made Easy ebook from ECFA and how you can access this valuable free download. Tracy? Hey, thanks, Dan and Michael. And you're right. We know some of these areas like church reporting can seem pretty overwhelming, especially if you're new to serving as a pastor or church administrator and are just trying to get your head around the unique rules for pastors and churches and what's required. That's why our team has created another terrific resource in the form of an ebook, Church Reporting Made Easy. In just a little over 50 pages, Dan, Michael and John Van Drunen from ECFA have taken the time to outline the most important tax and reporting rules for churches. This must have guide includes easy to follow explanations in plain English, sample forms and worksheets, recent and last minute changes in this year's tax laws, and a calendar of important filing dates to help you keep track of what's due when. Visit the resources page at ecfa.church and click on ECFA tax booklets to get your copy of this free ebook download of Church Reporting Made Easy. Again, that's ecfa.church slash resources. You can also email me at tracy at ecfa.org and we hope that this resource is a great blessing to your church. Before I send it back to Dan and Michael, I have to get in my tax funny. And this one is one that I can definitely identify with. It says, like mothers, taxes are often misunderstood, but seldom forgotten. Back to you, Dan and Michael. Well, thanks, Tracy. Helping pastors and churches untangle the confusing web of tax rules has been a passion of mine for some time. I first began publishing these tax booklets over 25 years ago. Since that time, we've been able to help a lot of folks. If you haven't already, I hope you take time to visit our website, ecfa.church, or email Tracy for a free copy of this helpful resource. Also, don't forget, if you have questions that you'd like to have answered on a future podcast, remember to email us your questions at podcast at ecfa.org. That's podcast at ecfa.org. And while you're at it, tell us what you think of the podcast and topics you'd like to learn more about relating to excellence in church administration. We look forward to hearing from you. Well, Michael, can you close us out with some encouragement for our listeners? Absolutely. And I would go back to something that you said, Dan, at the beginning of the podcast that really struck me. You said that we should do all things for the glory of God, even things that may seem mundane or a chore, like employer tax reporting. And I know there are similar themes throughout Scripture, but in particular, Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him.
This is really such a great verse and should be an encouragement to us all that our work for the Lord is not in vain. Whatever we do, whether it's small or large, seen or unseen. And I would just say in closing, just for all of our listeners, please know at ECFA, we believe in you and we stand with you as you carry out this important work of maintaining excellence in church administration. And if there's ever anything we can do to support or serve your church, don't hesitate to contact us. You'll find lots of great tools and resources at ecfa.church. And in the meantime, we'll look forward to being with you next time on the podcast. Take care and God bless.